it's important for me to tell my story because it's powerful to other people. I've dealt so well with these things that have happened to me, you know, losing an arm, and I know that lots of people haven't. And I know that lots of people struggle day to day with their lives. My story is, is powerful for so many reasons and you know my story that precedes the injury i have conquered a lot of a lot of hard things in life and i think that uh, a lot of people could learn a lot from that and what's just happened has got me thinking in lots of different ways about my own story and and i think that people need to hear more of these stories they have a lot of gravity welcome to young blood an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority my name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through because we're not alone. Let's do it. Trigger warning, if you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Gabe, how did you lose your arm? I tore my bicep in the gym and had some surgery a couple of days later. Two weeks after that, I had a post-operative infection called necrotizing fasciitis, which gave me 11 major surgeries during a 10-day coma. And was it the case that they said you're gonna lose your arm as soon as they diagnosed you with having that issue? Or was it a touch and go situation? Basically it was touch and go. It was like, it was like three days after the surgery, a locum came out and said, right, off to hospital rushed me in and I don't, I don't recall those three days at all. The infection took over, ruined my memory. But basically I was put into coma and it was a question of whether or not I was gonna live. They just had to keep chopping parts away. Because it turns your blood septic and it can potentially kill you if it keeps going? It, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like my dad was calling my friends up saying, looks like Gabe's gonna die. It was hot water for quite a while. But a bicep tear, that does happen. So just a freak bout of being incredibly unlucky that it ended that way. Basically, yeah, a combination of a few things, but um, yeah, no antibiotics and very unlucky to catch the bug. And as a major turning point in your life, but it had been a long story of mental health struggles up to that point. What led to you feeling so depressed and anxious when you were as young as six years old? That's a good question. My brother was quite sick growing up. He had something called a Chiari malformation. He had surgery at 15 when he was diagnosed, but there was a lot of behavioral problems leading up to that and a lot of violence in the house and pretty hectic environment to grow up in. So how did that make you feel as a little kid? Very on edge? On edge, unsafe, anxious, depressed, like oh, it just shook me. Really bad then. Did you have any reprieve from that? Like any safe spaces to go? Not really. Everywhere I went, like, yeah, no. How was the fact that you were struggling so much treated by those around you at that time? Did they acknowledge it? That was sort of normality to me. So it was not really something that I spoke about that much. Like, I suppose I spoke to my mum about it a little bit, but there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue about it. Did you have much of an understanding of yourself or why you were feeling the ways that you did or you just normalised it and thought that's what life was? Not through those, no, you know, those early years. Like, that's, that's just what life was to me. It's not until much later on in life that I realised how violent, you know, the environment was growing up and that feeling of being unsafe mm. and how it can affect you as a child. Like, like waiting for something to go wrong? Yeah, yeah. So how did that progress through your teenage years in terms of your mental health? A few family breakdowns throughout my teenage years. It came to a bit of a head when I was 14-ish. Um, and basically I wound up bailing from home. A whole lot of pretty negative circumstances that led to me basically not being able to live in a safe space. A friend of mine's parents owned the old Stormy Summers, the old brothel, and there was basically seven or eight of us. I was probably the youngest, up to 19, all kind of come from broken homes, struggling, and we're all kind of there and misbehaving and, you know, in a bad place. That was probably the peak of 
that situation as a you know as a, as a teenager as a child, and I suppose when I came out of that, it was back home, finished school. Did you feel like anyone cared? Was anyone there for you through this period? No. No. How did that affect the way you felt about yourself? It was a really miserable time, man. I grown up with a pretty close family, and um, you know through this time really contact from anyone really you know no one you know besides this group of a few young men that were also in a pretty shit spot like yeah it didn't seem like anyone cared you know when we came out on the other side it was like yeah <laughs> when i reflect on it it's like there's it's a pretty fucked up thing for someone that age to go through do someone put you through therapy or attempt to or put you on medication, anything like that? There was medication through most of my teenage years. How did that not help? Like I suppose it helped instantaneously when I was in that real bad spot. I would go on them, but then... Like antidepressants and things like yeah, that? Yeah, antidepressants, but like, or you know, even some benzodiazepines, Valium or something, crippling anxiety, calm some of that, but... Just a Band-Aid? Yeah, exactly. Because at that age, it's like, you know, how do you treat the source and you know even though I put some effort into going to speak to psychologists or therapy it's a difficult thing to tackle. Well there's so many factors and so much that goes into it and it's a large part of it's environmental. Yeah. Was that part of it acknowledged like what was going on at home and everything around you or is it very much like you're the problem Gabe take these drugs and get on with it? I suppose I never really had the finger pointed at me when I think back to it, it was infrequent, the therapy that I had. Looking back, I probably didn't explain the environment that I was in very well because I didn't... Well, maybe you didn't feel like you had the words to be able to do that. And I don't think I understood the gravity of it. For me to say I grew up in a violent environment, to me it kind of seemed like that was a little bit too far of a thing to say, but like, you know, as an adult, I realized like, it's not normal. I guess it was something that I didn't really think of as something worth talking about. Where did you find joy or moments of joy, especially in childhood? Probably my pets. Yeah. That's what sticks out to me. Mm. You know, I had a little dog, cats. Yeah. Get out, stay at friends' houses. That was good, you know, I suppose that that's that was a bit of um any time you could get relief and sort of escape that. That was a bit of a safe space, yeah. Yeah. I spent like I spent quite a few nights staying at French houses on the weekends in primary school and Yeah. Hmm. Where did you find connection and belonging as you got a bit older? As I got a bit older probably with those people that struggled. You know, those young men that, that were struggling a little bit and they were my friends, you know. You're all coping with trauma that you were repressing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we all knew to some extent some trauma that was happening to each other, but there was not a whole lot of dialogue about it. We just kind of all blocked it out together. And, and do you think that was because none of you really wanted to acknowledge it because it was so painful? all of yeah. you anyway and yeah. what would you do with it i suppose yeah we're all far too young and even like you know the ones that are 18 19 i suppose even at that age you're not old enough you, you don't have the maturity to kind of fully appreciate the impact of that kind of environment growing up in or if you did like what the fuck would you do with it not going to school no not going to school um maybe rocking up once once a blue moon I always had the ability to kind of talk my way around getting in trouble for not being at school. So there was never any attention brought to the fact that I wasn't present. Right. Yeah. So where did you see your life going at that young age? At that age, you, you, you know, you've got crazy hormones, you, puberty, everything's... Yeah, there's already a lot to deal with anyway. There's a lot going <laughs> on, man. I had no idea. Was it very much a day by day? yeah approach absolutely i was a victim man at that point in my life i was a massive victim and i was 
feeling so sorry for myself. I was blaming my family for all kinds of shit. I remember this one moment when I was sitting around a table with my friends and I was whinging about something that happened to me in my life. My friend's stepdad said, you're whinging about this, but at some point you've got to just be a man. Like you've got to grow up and be a man. And I was like, fuck. Like it hit home. It hit me really hard, man. And it's something that I'll never ever forget. It was probably the first step of me kind of learning not to be a victim in my life. Mm. Because you were always gonna have that as an excuse because you exactly. were unfortunate to have all these things happen to you. And that's always gonna be the case. It's always gonna be part of your past, but you can choose whether you're gonna perceive it as a victim or as a survivor or choose to be the man that you ultimately become. Yeah. Man. But plenty of people, when it's difficult to blame them, you gotta have some compassion they have go through awful things and they continue to have that victim mentality because that's one way that you can perceive it. But with no one to come and save you or help you and do the things that should have just been granted to you anyway as a kid, it was all on you to find a way to figure it out or not, which would just be a disaster. Exactly. That one instance of that adult, you know, the adult that seemed to have his shit together probably one of the only adults that i respected and for him to be straightforward and say this to me you just gotta grow up you gotta be a man mm -hmm. it was like you know it was a good piece of advice and what the hell did do you think being a man meant then i suppose the language that i would use now would be that i needed to stop being such a victim and take responsibility yeah take responsibility for my own life and move forward and not be pointing the finger and being miserable and blaming everyone else for it because you know this is not something i realized then but like in some way this is how i would have viewed it but like you know happiness is our choice man and we can choose to be hung up on negative things on trauma but then you can choose to move forward and be happy it's not a choice you can just make once and you're good though, is it? It's, uh, no. And every, every minute of every day. And I didn't choose to be happy back then. I chose to stop playing the victim card so much. Because it wasn't getting you anywhere. Yeah. When did you first feel like appreciated or like you could offer something? When I was, when I was at school, I was quite a good student. And there was like quite a heavy emphasis put on that in my family. So... My dad's an academic, like he like really appreciates that. So when I finally finished Concordia, did some good subjects, put some work in. Um, I want to say like my dad, my dad loves me. He's always, you know, we've had our, we've had our issues. We've had a, you know, families are a difficult thing to deal with, but like he's always tried his best to be a loving father. Although at some points I felt like there was nothing, you know, my family in younger years did they spent some time looking after me and they did love me. Um, but I suppose when I felt value would have been school a little bit, but then more so when I started going to the gym, which was immediately after I finished school. What got you in there? Like I'd been doing some Muay Thai just beforehand and I loved it. But you know, at that age, the same thing. Like I couldn't stick to anything. Like I was, I was never committed to anything like I was I was I'm an extremist by nature so I was in the gym four days a week while I was at school four or five days a week but then when I got out I was like okay one of my older friends he was in the gym lots he was a big dude he kind of commanded respect and in my my head it was because he was like he was a big dude you know mm. got girls and that's that's what I wanted and I think for young men in particular and I was the same it just seems like a simple way forward in terms of establishing yourself as a man and getting some respect and some of that validation from other people that you're worth something or you're someone that people should look up to or want to include and building your bodies a really straightforward way of doing that especially in a world where men less and less know what our purpose is or what our function is with some of those traditional roles not being the same as they have been in the past i think for young men to just say, well, if I just go and get really jacked, everyone's going to respect me and girls are going to look at me and that's sort of enough to start on that path. And then I guess along the way, discover 
more self-respect and self-worth through that discipline. And I found for me, because I've trained for 10 years, that like applying that discipline to the rest of my life is actually what's been the, the gold that's come out of it. You rock up even when you don't want to. You, you do what you can. You progress over time. Things take a lot longer than you would have thought they're going to, but you stick at it anyway. And that's actually what you get out of it. But it starts off when you're in your late teens, early 20s, just being like, I just want to be a big unit that everyone reckons is a mad dog. <laughs> basically, <laughs> man, yeah. basically, but yeah, I, but, and I suppose you know there's all this insight and you know this, the, all these amazing things come from training. But as I said, it's just like I just want to be a force to be reckoned with. I just want to be a big dude. I just want to be bigger than ever. I just want people to look at me and walk around like I was a freak. That's what I always wanted. And I suppose part of that is you didn't want to be a victim anymore either. You didn't want anyone to be able to hurt you. So Absolutely. building yourself up like that, it's like yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How did that manifest over the years? How did you start to view yourself differently? And did it work out the way you were hoping in terms of how that was received by other people? Yeah, definitely. Built my ego. Like I still struggled with my mental health for years and years, but there was direct correlation with my training and my mental health, which I suppose, and I know this happens to a lot of people, you know, you don't exercise, you don't train, you go downhill. In terms of me feeling like a man and me feeling... Like you were worth something. Yeah, having that respect given to me, you know, being in the gym, lifting heavy, being big, that's something that was really important to me. And... And having something to do, like having a goal. Yeah, absolutely. Like I was going to uni, like I started uni, like no interest in it, like I just kind of plotted along. There was no interest in my life except that. And it was really like a driving force in my life but you're still pretty unsettled by the depression and the anxiety through that phase of your life as well sometimes where you got real down how did you go about navigating that mentally and, and saying i'm not gonna let myself get depressed like what was your inner dialogue throughout my early adult years i was terrible at it like I would just get depressed. I would stay in bed. I would do nothing, man. Like, I would lose my gains, like. Which would make you more depressed. More depressed, yeah. and that would just send me into a hole, man. Sometimes, like, you know, sometimes last months, man. Mm. And vicious cycle, because part of the reason you're depressed is because you're not doing anything. Exactly, and You're man. not doing anything because you're depressed. Yeah, the one thing that I'm passionate about, you know, training and looking good, you know, all goes downhill. And then the other product of that is, is when you're trying to be big, you eat like a fucking animal, right? When you're not training and you keep eating like an animal, Skip you that. turn into an eyesore. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, you turn incredibly fat, like, and this is my yo-yo. This is what happened to me for years, man. Because I'm like training, training, training hard, man. Like training twice a day, eating heaps, it's putting muscle on it, like it's good for me. But then as soon as I stop training, I'm still eating like a maniac. It'd be bad, man. And I've like... I've but then got... you were conditioned to eat like that by that point. Yeah, yeah. And I got fat, man. I got fat and then I would lose weight and then I would get big and then I would get fat again. Yeah. And, I and had... because you, you know, at least in your mind, you valued your body more than anything else, there must have been self-loathing there. Oh, Oh, yeah. Mm. He, he's, loathing is, yeah, probably a nice way of putting it, man. And, and, like, there's probably no point where I got away from that self-loathing. Like, even being in the gym was kind like of even when, even when I was Even when I was looking good and I was big, like, I would I would have some small bits of satisfaction from it, but then most of the time it would never be good enough. I be never looked good. and Body dysmorphia. and Really, really, even like... Even when you were training, you were, like, punishing yourself. Yeah. No matter how good I looked, like, I, I could look in the mirror and be like, yeah, you look good. Ten minutes later, look back, be like, this is wrong. Mm. And just be an anxious mess over it, man. Which sounds like it's at the root of it. It's you didn't love yourself. No, yeah. So how long have you been training before you tore your bicep? Uh, was <laughs> ten years, man. So I had yeah, ten years of training behind me, and I tore my bicep. And did you have goals for it? Like, did you want to compete? How'd you compete anything like that? Uh, so, like, I suppose in probably the year-ish leading up to tearing my bicep, I started boxing. Mm. I was, like, big man, but I'd never done really any cardio. And I started boxing, and I was, like, starting to look like a fair weapon. Like, I felt so good about myself. There was no depression going on then. Like, I was killing and it. And you'd never felt good about yourself? No. 
I suppose I had a turning point. Like I, I was, I, I was in a long-term relationship where I was, I was engaged just to gloss over it quickly. Like I always knew that my depression was a problem, but when I entered a relationship with this person, I was happy for the first time in my life. We were together for all this time and I could be depressed and she would be there for me and I would wake up and I'd be feeling like shit. And, I, and she would always be there. So there was no consequences for me being miserable and me, you know, not getting my shit together. We broke up. Best thing that ever happened to me. It was like a safety net got taken away. Yeah. And, and it was like, you know, I've just lost the one thing that made me happy. For the seven years, like I was genuinely happy. Like we had the best relationship. Loved it a bit. Mm. But then this is gone and it's like, okay, shit, like you, you have to change your life because it's like, how the fuck are you gonna live a happy life with anyone if you don't get up and stop being depressed? And cause I know the cycle, I knew the cycle then. You get sad, you don't train, you don't do this. From that day, everything changed, you know? It was like, oh, I had a you know a little bit of downtime after we broke up, but it was like, get my shit together, get it all done. How did you keep that momentum going? I suppose it was such a monumental thing to happen to me to lose her. It was just this massive moment of clarity. Like, I'm never going to change like this. Like, I'm never going to be depressed again. This is never going to happen to me again. I won't be able to live a happy life if I do that. Mm. And it was awesome, man. And it sounds like you realise you actually do value your life and you actually do want something out of your life. Yeah, I, I, I got all that I valued myself. I valued my life. I was going the right way to finish uni, man. I was about to finish civil engineering degree. Like, I was killing in the gym, like... Mm, you're on a roll. Yeah, man. Fucking oath. And then the bicep. Yeah. Got torn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bam. You know. Life be like that sometimes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, man. Um, <laughs> new challenge. So when you woke up in hospital and you looked at your arm in the mirror, how did you react to that? Three days after I woke up, I looked in the mirror. Um, it was uh, it's hard for me to put into words because I was on so many fucking drugs. There was no clarity. It was surreal. Mm, the image wouldn't have made sense to your brain. It didn't compute you exactly. It was like, what's, what am I looking at kind of thing. And I knew it had happened and like, I suppose really quickly, I just started thinking because of that, you know, victim mentality that I had previously. It straight away, it was like, you can't like, you can't be a victim about this. Like, no matter what happened, like, this is a shocking thing to happen, but like. But that was get... there in reserve, that mindset that you'd already crafted. Yeah. So it actually helped at that point. Oh, amazing, man. Because you're already so strong, because you just survived so much before that happened. You, you were, yeah, it was, you know, straight away. It was like, right, get up and get going. You got to get back to the gym, you got to get back to this. I lost 30 kilos. Man, during coma and like surgeries and stuff. How long were you in there? The 30 kilos was probably over like a, like a month or six week period, but like the brunt of that was in two weeks, man. I was kind of keen to stop taking painkillers, stop taking everything. I wanted to get out of there. I didn't have any skin on my chest and my arm for six weeks, man. But like I was able to get out of the hospital and stay at home a little bit a few weeks afterwards and... um. What about just seeing yourself be injured so horrifically like that? It must be hard to take that in and contemplate that in your mind because and it's all healed up now and looks very different to how it did when it first, but it was, like you said, a catastrophic injury. What's it like to see that every day and just go like, fuck. Every morning was like, I wake up, look in the mirror, oh, yeah, I'm living a nightmare. Like, this is a nightmare. Also coming from that background of being so obsessed with how I look, Looking in the mirror, you know. Did it feel like you'd lost everything? Yeah, yep, absolutely. But I knew there were so many things that I was in control of. There was so much room that I had to progress that mm. I was in control of. Mm. So that's a very stoic perspective to take there where you focus on what you can control and not what you can't control. And what you can't control is just so devastating, but one of the ways of being able to move through something is go, all right, well, I can do this and I can do this. So I'm just going to do that. Focus on that. It seems like you were able to go there straight away. Yep, absolutely. I had to focus on that. Who was there for you? Well, I had a partner at the time when I woke up. She's fantastic. She, um, she was extremely helpful. It would have been very, very difficult without her by my side through the hospital. My dad there 
champ. Like, even to this day, like, he fucking helps me out so much. Like, I'd, I'd be in a really bad spot without him. How'd they react to seeing what had happened? Because <sighs> it's so hard for them to see that too, you know, the people who love you. Yeah, well, you know, like, I had a whole lot of friends, you know, while I was in coma, like, a whole lot of people kind of lost the plot. I and mean, it was a really hard time for everyone. Um, my dad, fucking poor bastard, he's been through it with his kids, you know, like, you know, I brought his brain surgery, this, you know, almost died a few years beforehand. Italy had to come over, thought I was going to die then. Um, and you can see that with new eyes now, that you're older and you've been through what you've been through and have more compassion for that too. Absolutely, man. And that, that's something that comes with age, you know, like I have so much respect for my dad and he's been there so much and fuck, he's awesome, man. My mum rocked up briefly, caused a fuss, moved on. I haven't spoken to her since. Mm. You know, I had, I had quite a few friends and men that were there for me. My friend Eddie in Melbourne came over to cook some food. My friend Nick, you know, come pick me up, make me soups all the time. So there's a lot of people that care about you. But yeah, yeah. I felt I was, man, I was so lucky, and man. And that's when you find out. Yeah. That's when you find out who's my, actually there. My friends bought me a car, man, you know, because I drove a manual and they all kind of pulled in coin together, bought me a car, like, okay. I felt some real love, man. Mm. Like, it was very touching. And that must have inspired you to control what you could control and absolutely. And, come and, back from it. Um, absolutely. There were so many people that cared, and I know there were so many people that struggled through the time that I almost died that, like, I didn't want them to see me sad. And I know that a lot of people really, they've seen me struggling through my mental health, and a lot of people told me afterwards, like, fuck, we... We didn't know what was going to happen, man. We didn't know if you were going to rake up and... It would be not... too much to bear. Yeah, but, like, I had to... You felt like you had to be strong for them, even for... though it was happening to you. It was a really, like, important thing for me. It was a really good tool, because, like, I, I, would, I would say that I'm good, and like, I would, you know, not thinking about the negatives. Like, I was moving forward, and it was, it was really important for me to kind of be as positive for everyone that I love, because I knew that it was really important to them. You know, my friends love me, man. I love my friends and I'm so lucky. My family loves me. The power that me saying that I'm doing well, like the happiness that it gives my friends was so like, I, mean, I feel emotional thinking about it, man. Like it's like, that was, that was a really powerful tool for me. Do you know what I mean? And then you lost one of your best mates. Yeah. Because you hadn't had enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Steve, you know, we were hanging out and left my house and I had a big hug. Said, you know, I'll see you in a couple of days, bro. And then poof, the next day I got a call from a friend saying, yeah, Steve's dead. I was like, fuck, what? You know, poor bloke had a heart attack. He really cared about my recovery. He really cared about me. We had this awesome relationship and I really, really valued him. And I loved the bloke, you know, and um, and then he died and, and then I felt like it was all, that was the first time when I felt like it was all too much. Like I was breaking down, man. I felt like I'd lost my support. Fuck yeah, it just, it really made it very difficult to stay strong. I've probably never been that emotional in my life. There was a point when I remember thinking like, hang on, Steve loved me. Like Steve, like the rest of my friends, like he wanted to see me happy. He wanted to see me killing it. He was an extremist like me. Do you know what I mean? He wanted to be the best at everything. He wanted to be the strongest. He wanted to be the biggest. Like he... You know, I have so much fucking respect for the bloke. He was so intelligent and... He would have hated to see you wallowing. He would have hated it, man. Like, I needed to turn this misery around and make it a powerful thing to work for me. Because it was like, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to honour Steve. I'm going to honour what he was like. He wanted to be the best at things, you know. And I suppose that was part of what led me to wanting to pursue a Paralympic dream, to be a world champion, to be number one. 
and he became this really powerful, positive source of inspiration for me. He was amazing and I wanted to be amazing. I want him to be proud of me. Would you imagine his voice in various situations and what he would have said and did you talk to him? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, lots of things. <laughs> he, he, uh, I remember you know, I just started doing some long distance running. He said, why the fuck would you want to run, dude? It's boring as fuck. Thinking, he didn't like the cardio. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever I did, he would want me to be the best at it. Yeah. You know, and uh, and there was dialogue, you know. Sometimes when I think about things, I think, you know, what would he say? You know, he'd say, I love you, bro. Do it. I'm proud of you. Get it done. Yeah. Isn't it beautiful how he's still with you? Oh, man. It's, I suppose I, I think about him regularly, but I haven't put it into words, and it's making me... <laughs> Quite emotional. He's a fucking beautiful thing. It's a powerful thing, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's like my mate who I lost to suicide just had this relentless work ethic. Like he was an absolute workhorse and just a beast of a man. And I try to embody that trait that he had in my own life. And I think about the same thing and just how hard he worked and how much he wanted to live and try to carry that forward as much as I can myself because what else can you do? And but you get to a point where you can look back and just appreciate that so much in them and that they were able to touch your life with that and that you can then embody that as much as you can is just a beautiful thing. It's beautiful, man. And the fact that those positive parts of him live on in me, you know? Yeah. Uh, amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah. How yeah. did you find sprint cycling once you got bored of doing running? <laughs> <laughs> well... And this is something Steve would have liked. He would have liked the idea of sprint cycling. Going fast. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, you know, like I was in running, but I went to cycling and I was doing enduro cycling, like some long distance stuff. And and I was committed, right? But like it was, it was a grind, man. Like I couldn't be in the gym. I couldn't put on muscle. Like, and I'd spent, you know, I'd spent this time. I got out of hospital and I'm trying to get calories and I'm trying to put weight back on. And I put a fair bit of weight back on. And then I'm thrown into this environment where I have to lose weight. Mm. And that went against everything that you were already good at, that you knew how to do, that you built over all these years. I don't have a long distance engine. I suppose I didn't fully appreciate the difference and how hard it was me trying to tackle that. And then I changed March nationals, track nationals in Brisbane. Had a conversation with the national coach and he basically said, seeing he got the body type, why don't you do this? I've been doing it and I'm fucking hell. Life's so good. You because love it because that means you can get in the gym and pump your legs and that makes a massive difference i'm my upper body man like my 10 years of training age actually comes into play mm. it went from me being a complete novice knowing absolutely nothing to me actually having something to bring to the table so it wasn't like it was all a waste it was all for nothing yeah exactly exactly and and, and you know and, and being able to put some muscle on being able to could build my ego up a little bit, man. Yeah. And like, be in that same environment that you used to love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm so happy doing what I'm doing, you know. Like, I was happy doing it before, but it was hard, man. And, and I, again, I was never willing to admit how hard it was. But when I look back on it, it was like, I was just flogging a dead horse, man. So how long have you been doing that for now? Since March. Since March. So a few months on lifting heavy weights and... Riding around in circles and track and... Sounds like it didn't take long for you to go like, that's it, I'm doing this. Well, yeah, because I'd already decided, like, I'm going to cycle, like, I'm going to compete, like, I'm... Yeah. And I just did poorly, man. <laughs> like, it was it was going to be a hard road. Like, I, I could have got there, but... Yeah, but you would have been working against yourself because yeah. you're much more suited to something else. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the idea of Paris and the Paris Paralympics became something that I, in my head, you know, that's doable. Why? Doing this. Why do you want that? Because I'm an extremist. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm an extremist. Because I want to be go harder, go harder. You know, like like before. Like I wanted to be a freak. I wanted to be the biggest dude. Like now I'm. You know, there's not a whole lot of powers in the world. You know, like I want to be the best. I want to prove it to myself. I want to be in a better place than I ever was before. Like I'm. I, I'm disabled now. Like I've lost this part of me. I don't know. There's some problems with self worth there. I want to get that back, man. Like I want to be. I just want to be the best at something, you know? I don't want to be pitied, I want to be admired. Mm, yeah. Well what has having that goal done for you? That purpose, man. 
that purpose and that direction in life is so powerful. There's a reason to get up. There's a reason to do, you know, I have my training. There's, there's, there's method to everything. I'm so disciplined, man. I'm so organized. Like I've never been so organized in my life. Like the runoffs of being this athlete that's got this tunnel vision. I don't have a very balanced life. That's not important to me because there's no one who wants to be a world champion who's going to get there who has a balanced life. Um, but at the same time, doesn't matter. I'm doing everything I need to do. I look after my dog. I'm happy, man. I've got <laughs> friends, like, you know. You're you alive. <laughs> yeah, fuck, I'm here. I'm happy, man. Like, you know, I wake up every day smiling. It's, I'm doing what I love, man. And that's... And I think it would make sense that part of the reason you're going so hard is because the gravity of still having this opportunity weighs on you you understand that and you feel that deeply both because of what you've been through but also losing your friend like you wake up with that sense and you feel that to more of an extreme than your everyday person because you haven't lived a, a ho-hum life to this point absolutely man you can just die tomorrow and this is something like you know that that kind of drove me into this path quickly it was like i've had a few close encounters with death and every time it's just happened out of nowhere man and it's like, that's, that's life. Steve, dead. Remember like when he was at my house, I gave him a hug hours beforehand and he's fucking dead. I was saying, you know, when I woke up, I was like, this, I'm going to go to Paralympics. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then I was like, a couple months in, like, I was still recovering, but I was like, hang on, I could die tomorrow. I, like, I could die the guy that said he wanted to do this. Fuck that. I have these opportunities. I'm going to make the most of them. As a para, you have amazing opportunities. If you're willing to put the work in, blessed, man. Yeah, that's your choice. Yeah, absolutely. Ab absolutely. And I feel so lucky to have those choices, man. I get to train with some pretty impressive athletes and I get to be in an environment which is inspiring, man. Like, I've got some amazing, like, friends who are like able-bodied athletes. Without this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, none of that would be, you know, like, so this is the best and worst, but the best thing that's ever happened to me. Why are you a better man now? I'm on a better path and I'm going to do more powerful things in my life. I want to make a difference. Like I want to help people. I know that I have approached my trauma and my accident in such a way that is better than what most people would. And I think that there's a responsibility there for me to be able to get some success in order to be able to spread that message a bit more. Objectively, you have so much more to offer than just an athletic pursuit, but I understand using that as a vehicle to then share your story and make it so much more than that because it is so powerful when you've experienced so much and you've got so much potential to be able to have some real impact, which I think ultimately would actually mean more to you. Absolutely. But being able to have that goal and that clear path to follow and then do the other stuff around it makes total sense yeah man. but it's not like gabe he's just the cyclist now who's going to be a, a paralympian one day like he, there's always going to be a lot more to it than that that means everything there's some self-talk you know goes why are you doing this what's my motivation and one of my biggest motivators is when not if right <laughs> Let's make that very clear. When it happens, the number of people that I can reach, the number of people that will have respect for me, I just become such a powerful tool then to spread the good word. Yeah, because it's the message that you have to spread that actually holds the weight that people yeah. are going to be able to apply to their lives without going and being a Paralympian. Exactly. Exactly, man. And, you know, the message is good now, but when I get there, it'll be even better. Mm. The story's good now. The story's going to be fucking awesome at the end of it, man. <laughs> you don't want that to impact people. Yeah, and that's the life you want to live because yes. it's better than the alternative. Absolutely, yeah. So do you love the man you've become now? Yep. All right. I love most, yeah, I love what I do. I love, you know, there's, that, there's always that self-loathing there from a visual point of view. 
Um, there's always that body dysmorphia that kind of still plays on that. And, you know, there's always... But given that your mindset's shifted and you're so much more now and you have such a bigger mission and more important priorities than that, does that influence your capacity to love yourself differently? Yeah. Yeah, look, like, lucky. You're walking the walk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where I am now, I've made some real progress and I'm proud of where I am. Pride isn't a word that I would have ever used previously. I suppose that is the biggest indicator of self-love for me. Yeah, you should be proud, bro. Thanks, man. Yeah. And I can't wait to watch you at the Paralympics and be like, we had that guy on the podcast, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, that's a win. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, fuck yeah. Thanks, bro. Thanks, brother. <laughs> That's it for this episode. If you're getting some value out of the show, please help us out with a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Everything we do is recorded in video, so follow Youngblood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Facebook and Youngblood Mental Health on TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and please leave us a comment or send us a message if these stories resonate. We'd love to hear from you. You can sign up to our e-news through our website, youngbloodmedia.com.au. And most importantly, please share the podcast with anyone in your life who might need it. We're all about reaching as many people as we can. This is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission. Catch you next time.